The identity of an individual is essentially a function of her choices rather than an immutable attribute. These are the words of none other than our chief guest for this evening, Professor Amartya Sen, philosopher, economist, teacher, and moralist. There is an interesting anecdote about Amartya Sen. In a study on differences between baby girls and boys, he employed an assistant to weigh the children. Problems arose when the children did not want to be weighed and the assistant was not able to do anything. So a young Sen cycled through the countryside of West Bengal, weighing the children himself. His trusty bicycle now finds pride of place at the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. Born in Shantiniketan, Bengal in 1933, a little boy was given the name Omorto or Amartya, the immortal by Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. This is a story about this little boy who grew up to be one of the greatest economic thinkers of this century. During his growing years, he lived largely on campuses surrounded by erudite elders, teachers and peers, providing rich and fertile soil for young Amartya. When still young, he changed lanes a few times, flirting in turn with Sanskrit, mathematics and physics before settling for the eccentric charms of economics. At an impressionable age of nine, Amartya witnessed the Bengal famine of 1943 in which three million people perished. This influenced him immensely and shaped his thought process. His academic pursuits gained momentum when he joined Presidency College, Kolkata. He went on to study at Trinity College, Cambridge. Meanwhile, he sped on along his chosen career path, teaching at some of the most prestigious universities in the world, including Jadavpur University, Cambridge, where he was the master of Trinity College, Berkeley, Cornell, Stanford, Delhi School of Economics, and Harvard, where he is both professor of economics as well as philosophy. A large part of Sen's work is about the conditions of the most impoverished members of society and how these can be improved. He balanced his concern for the marginalized with theoretical rigor Few intellectuals have garnered as much academic respect and at the same time, so much influence on global policy. Few have received as many accolades, more than a hundred honorary degrees and countless awards, including the Nobel Prize and India's Bharat Ratna. Known as the conscience of economics, he is today one of the foremost economic thinkers of this century. Not one to rest on his laurels, he continues to drive a mean timetable, pedaling on at 85, a powerhouse, tireless and unstoppable. We are proud and happy to welcome our chief guest for today, Professor Amartya Sen. And now to formally introduce our chief guest, I call upon Mr. Narayana Murthy. video said it all, but for all of us, it is worthwhile to hear a second time the extraordinary uh, achievements of uh, Amartya. It's indeed a great pleasure and a rare privilege for me to introduce Professor Amartya Sen to this audience. Professor Amartya Sen is the Thomas W. Lemont, Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts, United States. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998, the Bharat Ratna in 1999, and the National Humanities Medal of the US in 2012. Professor Amartya Sen was educated in Shantiniketan and in Presidency College, Calcutta, 
and he earned his PhD from Cambridge University. He has done extensive work in development economics and welfare economics. He has been called the Mother Teresa of economics. There are very few economists who understand economics in the context of social justice like he does. He has written several seminal books, won innumerable prestigious awards, and has received over 90 honorary doctorates. We are lucky to have had him as the founding jury chair of the Social Sciences Prize and the Humanities Prize. It was thanks to him that Infosys started the Humanities Prize. He has added a significant value to the Infosys Science Foundation from its birth in 2009 to 2018 when he relinquished his responsibility as jury chair. He has continued to be our friend, philosopher, and guide. It is indeed a great privilege, friends, to present Professor Amartya Sen to every one of you. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee. Now may I request Professor Sen to make his remarks. I'm afraid I'm going through some uh, medical challenges, so I hope you forgive me for speaking while sitting. <laughs> um, I intend the, I hope the conditions will change at some stage, but it hasn't changed yet. Is that, am I audible? Okay. Um, it's a great privilege for me to have a bit of a role in this wonderful location when the Infosys Prizes for Accomplishments in Science, Mathematics, Engineering, and Humanities are given to well-deserving winners. By instituting these awards, Narayan Murthy, my friend here, and his colleagues have not only established a splendid vehicle of intellectual recognition, they have also established a fine system for encouraging the creation of knowledge. So I begin by congratulating the winners we are honoring today. It's a great privilege for me to be with them today. Aside from being, uh, to talk about knowledge, aside from being a beautiful thing in itself, knowledge generates many different types of rewards, from productive use of inventions to the creation of new bonds among people who interact with each other. That's going to be my main theme of talking, but I am taking the liberty of breaking for my speech for <laughs> two or three minutes. I was so thrilled when I saw the picture of Marie Curie at the beginning of what science has done to humanities. Uh, for one thing, I won't be here, but for Marie Curie. When at the age of 18, I was told that I had an aggressive form of oral cancer and had a chance of about 15% to live for five more years. I was rather depressed, but uh, I always believed in science. Uh, and when the method of treatment, they knew then, radiation, I think I was one of the second or third cases done in Calcutta, uh, using very primitive methods. This was only about a decade after my Curie's uh, um, uh, own uh, uh, breakthrough. Um, it, it was an extraordinary experience, uh, a difficult one in many ways. Um, but then, instead of 
living for um, five years, 15% chance, uh, when I completed 67 years since then, I did think that I had some friendship with my Curry, which I ought to celebrate, because that would not have been possible <laughs> without that. It so happens that I'm actually going through a second bout of uh, cancer uh, of a different kind, very different kind. Uh, and again, uh, the treatment is radiation. What was, and which I have taken, and if I may make a confession, I'm fully hoping to win this one too. Uh, at the The, in the, two, in the uh, two thirds of his century, between my two cases of radiation, the technology has completely changed. When I first had it in Calcutta in 1952, it was radium mold, not very different from the kind of thing that Marie Curie herself had, 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 had actually worked with, like polonium on a lead case, since I had oral cancer, put it in my mouth and sit in a, in a, a, a rather um, uh, exacting chair for eight hours a day for more than a week every day. Uh, today, of course, there is a much more precise system uh, in my case, what is called image modulated radiotherapy, which is extremely precise and gets exactly where you do when you lie. Well, you basically lie underneath a linear accelerator. Uh, I think it's very important not to become too fond of the linear accelerator, even though I had to be in its company for uh, every day for nine weeks. Uh, for only small amount of time, I mean, it wasn't exacting in any way. But to think of all this, and the genius, in this case, beginning with Marie Curie and all the people she inspired, and their impact on my own life, is in some way the celebration of exactly what I think Infosys is celebrating, uh, and, and it gives me a sense of belonging, and I thought I'd take the liberty of uh, sharing uh, my own affiliation with uh, my career in particular, and science in general, and knowledge uh, altogether. So I come back to my text. In my brief remarks, I want to say a few words on the links between friendship and knowledge. Rabutin, Comte de Vaucy, uh, the French writer from the 17th century, famously remarked, I quote, love, love comes from blindness, friendship from knowledge. Now, I think there's some truth in that. Love may well result from the inability to see what one is getting into. <laughs> However, it has certainly enriched the world in many different ways, particularly through the creation of great literature, such as Romeo and Juliet, Shakuntala, and Lila and Maznoon. But we can ask, what does friendship produce? Whether or not knowledge generates it, as Bussi Rabutin claimed. In my remarks today, I want to concentrate particularly on the opposite direction of the influence emphasized by Rabutin, not on how knowledge produces friendship, but on how friendship generates knowledge. The understanding that friendship helps the creation of knowledge is particularly important 
in the philosophy and history of science. Nationalist sentiments may make a country claim some kind of a secluded flowering of science and mathematics only in that country, detached from the rest of the world, unrelated to what we can learn from others, from our friends. But that is not the way science and mathematics and ultimately culture too proceed. For example, the view of ancient India as an island <coughs> making its discoveries and inventions in splendid isolation, detached from the rest of the world, may be pleasing to intellectual nationalists in India, but that understanding is fundamentally mistaken. We learn from each other, and our intellectual horizons are expanded by being in touch with what others know, with whom we interact. Once acquired, our newly learned knowledge expands under its own dynamics, and we can then give to the outside world much more than we received from it. Consider the golden age <coughs> of Indian mathematics. This was not the Vedic period, to contrary to what is often claimed these days, exaggerated claims about Vedic mathematics have tended to generate a world of fantasy in parts of university education in India today, which I think we should resist. The golden age of mathematics in India was rather the classical period in the first millennium, quite close in time to the flowering on a different line of great literature, literature of Kalidas, Shudraka, and other writers who lived at that time. The great mathematical revolution in India was led particularly by Aryabhat, born in 476 AD. And what Aryabhat initiated was further developed by great mathematicians in India, like Varhaumihi, Brahmagupta, Bhaskar, in fact, two Bhaskars, and others. Aryabhat's departure had sophistication and extraordinary reach that were quite uncommon in the mathematics of its time. There is much evidence that while deeply original, as he was, Aryabhat's mathematics was substantially influenced to start with by mathematical development that had already taken place in Greece, in Babylon, and in Rome. There was outside influence there, and yet in Aryabhat's hand, mathematics in, idea, in India, and astronomy too, took gigantic leaps that were pioneering contribution to the whole world. India learned something from the rest of the world, but gave to the world enormously more than what it had learned from outside. And as new understandings were born in India, they spread abroad, not only to Greece and Rome, but particularly to China, where they played a central role in the extraordinary progress in Chinese astronomical work in particular. Even the head of the official Chinese Board of Astronomy in the critically important 8th century was an Indian mathematician called Gautama. And also it spread to the Arab-speaking world, which would become the vehicle of the most important mathematical progress of its time in the 8th century to the 11th century, as we still remember by the words like algorithm from the name of Al-Kharazmi and from his book, Al-Jawa, al, al, al muqabila 
comes the word algebra, which we still do. What began as India's um, learning something from others, soon became India's teaching a lot to others. And these others, in turn, by the way, many of these Arab mathematicians knew Sanskrit well, too, made their huge contribution to the world of mathematics. Friendship, in the broadest sense, including the ability to learn from each other, played a centrally important role in this interactive process, each step reinforcing the next across national boundaries. Emerging in the primitive form in Sumeria and Babylon, trigonometric ideas received the attention of Euclid and Archimedes in Greek mathematics in third century BC, and Hipparchus in Asia Minor a century later. But in the next century, in the first century BC, Surya Siddhanta in India aired trigonometric construction with further sophistication. The Greek influence particularly was clearly present in Indian mathematics. Uh, some of the terms used were Greek too. But Surya Siddhanta had more developed trigonometry, particularly applied to astronomy, than what Alexander the Great uh, had brought from Greece to India earlier. And that is his, uh, the, the Greek migration to India that happened by following that, to following his conquest, to following his um, um, conquest of Iran and then presence in India. In, to consider one example, when towards the end of the fifth century AD, Aryabhat produced his comprehensive account of advances in mathematics, including talking, among other things, about its application, uh, the, one of the earliest discussion of, of gravity uh, because of the spinning earth, how come objects are not thrown out? So the question of attraction of one object uh, uh, to others uh, came into the discussion. And a number of his uh, writings, uh, a number of his new theories, which the Iranian Arab mathematician Al Biruni uh, discussed very extensively how uh, extraordinarily radical these thoughts were. Among these thoughts, uh, and that's the one I was going to talk and uh, to end with, uh, is the trigonometric concept of what we call sine, S-I-N-E. Um, since I end up having all kinds of illnesses throughout my life, <laughs> I had malignant malaria when I was young and so on, and I had atrial fibrillation, which again was cured by signs by stopping your heart for a fraction of a second, uh, which is like rebooting your computer. And just the computer goes back to the original program, you go back to the original program with which I was born, and we were looking whether I was in sign rhythm yet. So sign rhythm is a very big presence in my life also. Now, it is Aryabhat's contribution to see how the sign works and how geometry translates into, into trigonometry. But the question arises, how did this Aryabhatian concept came to be called sign, which is not an Indian word in Sanskrit or in any other Indian language like Tamil. This bit of linguistic history, which I have discussed elsewhere, I should say, in my book, The Argumentative Indian, is worth recollecting in the present context of friendship and knowledge. 
I have had called the concept of sign by the Sanskrit name Jya Artha or half god. Jya is called half god, is the radius, and in geometric terms, you can see how the term, uh, how sign relates to half a chord. When the Arab mathematicians translated this concept into Arabic, they called this word jihad, that's J-Y-A, as we might say, into jiva, a corruption of jia. Arabic is written, like Hebrew, only with consonants, omitting the vowels. So Ariyabha's jia was represented as JV, omitting the vowels altogether, the two consonants of jiva. Now the sound jiva is not a word in Arabic, it has no meaning. But the same representation, JB, can also be pronounced, since you can choose your vowel, as Jab, which is a fine Arabic word, meaning a cove or a bay. When the Arab text on sophisticated trigonometry on the lines related to Aryabhat were ultimately translated into Latin, Gerardo, uh, Gerardo, a mathematician in Cremona in Italy, did the translation in 1150 AD. The word jave, meaning a covoy bay, was translated into the corresponding Latin word, namely sinus, which is Latin for a cove or a bay. And from there, from the word sinus, comes the modern trigonometric term, sine. The much used mathematical term, sine, carried within it the memory of Aryabhat's Sanskrit term, jia, and its sequential Arabic and Latin translations. What came to India from Europe in a somewhat simple form went back to Europe and the world as a more analyzed tool of mathematics and astronomy. So I conclude the separatist outlook in the development of science and mathematics and culture is seriously misleading. Indeed, the role of friendship applies not only across the national boundaries, but also within the borders of a country. Decision, division, tensions, and violence between groups and sects, sects, S-E-C-T-S, that political separatists like promoting, even within a nation, not only damage our social life, they can also work as barriers to intellectual, intellectual progress within a nation as well as, of course, across nations. So friendship has this critically important role, quite aside from its political and social implications. Uh, and, and, and this is, I think, an important thing to remember today in, in my country, in India. Indeed, the isolationist view of the progress of knowledge is fundamentally defective, no matter how appealing it may be to the nationalist and the sectarian. In, the wonderful gather in this wonderful gathering today, honoring the exceptional achievement of extraordinary scholars, and I take this opportunity of congratulating the winners again, if I may, we have reason to remember how important friendship is for our intellectual pursuits. Friendship does, of course, have many other rewards as well, but the advancement of science and mathematics and of knowledge in general is a important part, a very important part of the beautiful impact of friendship. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Sen. <laughs> Professor Sen, you are inspiring. Your stories are inspiring. Thank you for your love of research, for sharing your knowledge, and of course, your friendship that you've shown to the Infosys Science Foundation.